Well, hello to the Thai Yoga Center today. It's February 12th, 2021. And I'm here today to do an update on literally what is the Soma Veda system and give you an overview that is um, current to the year 2021. It's February and it's very exciting. There's been so many changes over the last year. However, the need and necessity for comprehensive uh, health care and spiritual support for healing is more now than ever before. And I am so grateful to be able to furnish uh, opportunities uh, for education in indigenous and traditional natural medicine, Ayurveda, Native American medicine, etc., through the Soma Veda College of Natural Medicine and the Thai Yoga Center. Our tribal organization, the Native American Indigenous Church, is primarily based on being able to furnish quality education for ministers and practitioners of sacred natural medicine. And we consider it not just an obligation, but it's a great honor to be able to do that. So I'm going to get right into it. Soma Veda Thai Yoga is initially based on a 164-hour certification uh, program, retreat, either in person, live, or online, which has very detailed introduction to Ayurvedic theory. Um, we are part of the Soma Veda College of Natural Medicine. We are part of the Native American Indigenous Church, and we have many other really interesting affiliations and recognitions, authorizations uh, as well. Let's start with this. Foolish is the doctor who despises the knowledge of the ancients. This is a quote from Hippocrates. Foolish is the doctor who despises the knowledge of the ancients. One of the things that is a hallmark or descriptor, if you will, of modern Western medicine is that it despises the knowledge of the ancients. There is some lip service where, you know, medicos will cite how they're ethical because they take a Hippocratic oath, which is debatable or not. But other than that, there really is no, uh, nothing more than lip service to the idea that medicine has existed for tens of thousands of years, and certainly for the last four to 6,000 years, in pretty much the same way that it's practiced today in most indigenous and traditional cultures around the world. And we have extensive documentation, both anthropology, archeology, span uh, medical um, anthropology, that pretty much uh, confirms this, as well as, of course, uh, major countries with billions of people, like the um, government or the country of India, which have adopted formally the traditional practice of indigenous medicine called, under their Ayush branch, or uh, Ayurveda and Unani medicine. We're part of that, that tradition, if you will, of keeping this medicine alive, which we feel is as valuable, as helpful, as necessary, and as functional as it ever was in the history of the world in the last thousand years, give or take or so. So what is Thai yoga? In Thai, uh, the traditional term to refer to it is Raksa Tangnuat Pamboran Thai. Raksa Tangnuat Pamboran Thai or the ancient Thai spiritual way of healing by laying on hands to manifest the spiritual energy of the heart in a practical way. I mean, just think about that for a second as a defining characteristic of a practice of functional medicine as being a spiritually based way of healing, which incorporates laying on of hands or chirothesia to manifest the spiritual energy of the heart in a practical way. So traditionally, the work that we do has been for many hundreds, if not thousand years, defined as the practical expression of loving kindness. 
How about that? Imagine a system of medicine that historically is defined as the practical expression of loving kindness, as opposed to all the other accurate, not accurate descriptors of Western allopathic traditions. Here's a picture, for example, of Karen tribe uh, villagers using a multiple therapist approach to Thai yoga after a day in the fields. And so by the light of the kerosene lamp in the handmade bamboo house, the traditional people, instead of watching uh, social media and watching the news, uh, after a, a really hard, exhausting day of work, doing hard labor in the rice fields and so on. They spend their evening sharing a healing experience with each other. Uh, this is usually uh, immediately after uh, having a meal. Okay, so they share a meal, they have this social aspect, and then as a community, as a family, they address the ills and woes and imbalances of each other. And that is actually a typical evening entertainment. We're so far from that, that it's it seems like that would be an alien enterprise, doesn't it? What are the primary outcomes of Soma Veda therapies? Now, all therapies have outcomes. Primary outcomes, what is, what is it they're trying to do? Uh, reduce infection, reduce inflammation, increase range of motion, uh, increase um, functional relationship of spinous process, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, correct uh, trauma from accidents and misadventure, detoxification from pesticides and from parasites and so on. All medicine systems have what they would describe as their primary outcomes. We have those too. The primary outcomes of Soma Veda therapies are Promiwihan Si, or the four boundless states of mind, which are love, joy, compassion, equanimity. Love, joy, compassion, and equanimity. Those are the four things that are the primary outcomes of our practice. And this comes from this, this traditional belief that love conquers all that the most powerful force for healing remediation, for the support and engenderment of wealth, of health and wellness, is in fact uh, love. And that love is a, a real thing. It's not an airy-fairy, it's not a philosophical concept. It is a real force. It is as real or more real than gravity and those of you who are a little nerdy like I am are probably familiar with the idea that what is gravity has not been solved as an equation. There's still a humongous debate going on right now as to what is gravity, what it is. We, scientists don't even know what it is. And they, and they freely admit that while at the same time using the term as if it is meaningful and substantial. Well, it is to a degree in context. However, I want to say in a historical, philosophical, social, medical context that love as an effective tool of functional medicine has far more substance and has far more history and has far more people who rely on it than people who think that uh, the world is round and not flat or that people think there's such a thing as gravity. And what does why does the earth want to revolve around the sun? Uh, in class, sometimes I like to get into this in a more detailed discussion. But for today, love, joy, compassion, and equanimity. Joy, uh, compassion is the practical expression of love. Joy is the consequence of the practical exp expression of love. And equanimity or, or mental health and balance of mind is a consequence of the expression of love, compassion, and joy. So we have there a spiritual, a mental, a physical, and a functional uh, formula or algorithm to move someone toward a more perfect health paradigm. The purpose of Soma Veda Therapeutics is to repair, restore, strengthen connection, communication, and awareness between 
the individual and spirit or oneness with themselves and with innate intelligence. It is to share and realize Promi Vihan Si, as I just said, for boundless, unlimited, or divine states of mind. To bring energy, attention, consciousness, breath, and pressure to bear on the entire person, spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical. To promote homeostatic and homeodynamic equilibriums between mind, body, and spirit. It's a fancy way, using some 50 cent words, of saying that this is a dynamic relationship which is balanced while it's in motion. To support spiritual growth, health, and well-being. To promote wellness and to alleviate pain and suffering. And to do so, we apply four principles of mastery. Now, these were originally taught to me by my teacher, Sifu Danny Inosanto, a student and protege of Bruce Lee. He's now often referred to as Grandmaster uh, Inosanto. And I'm very, very pleased and privileged to have spent uh, a chunk of my life uh, training with uh, uh, Sifu Inosanto and other JKD, Lee Jun Fan, and Jeet Kune Do instructors like Larry Hartzell, um, Tim Tackett, Richard Bustillo, Alfonso Tomez, and so on and so forth and actually having been certified as a teacher in 1981, which now seems to be ages ago. But one of the things I still practice every day that I learned in the Bruce Lee fighting method was number one, research your own experience. Number two, absorb what's useful. Number three, reject what's useless. Number four, add something specifically your own. Okay, and the important parts of this in this discussion today for me. One, it is personal to me. What I'm sharing with you of value is what I personally believe is the most valuable information in the world that I, I could share with you. And absorb what's useful is this idea of, of how um, we have learned, we have been given access to, we have adopted, and we practice ancient spiritual traditions of medicine and healing that are just as functional and productive today as they ever were a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago. And then we reject what's useless and we reject corporate medicine for the sake of profit. We reject invasive testing for no particular reason other than to generate income. We reject invasive surgeries, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, uh, or other medicines, medicants that cause large harm, even fatal consequences for hundreds of thousands of people a year, just as a consequence of being exposed to the medicine, people who die for no other reason than they went to see a doctor or they went to a hospital, or that they're being subjected to uh, medical procedures which are um, without informed voluntary consent. And we reject all this in favor of traditional medicine systems that are proven effective and which have no harm or downside as a general consequence of, of being involved in their practice. Now, Soma Veda focuses on life and health. We say that our tools are energy, attention, consciousness, breath, and pressure. These are the five fingers on our chirothesia hand of healing that's been uh, given to us and that we're authorized uh, to do. Now, what influences traditional Thai medicine since in traditional Thai medicine is such a big part of, of what we do because it is this, this functional tradition that still exists in the world today, thank God. What influences it? Maybe another way of saying, where does it come from? That's a hard question. And actually, I've written whole books on that, uh, uh, for example, that you could, you could look at, they have much more detailed history. But let's just say there are five primary influences, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, India, and Burma. And if you look up Thailand on a map, it's pretty much self-explanatory. Thai schools in the Soma Veda lineage, all right, our system, our trademark system, Soma Veda, 
is uh, directly descended from and directly affiliated with several traditional schools of Thai traditional medicine in Thailand. And we continue that relationship in the best way possible right to this minute. Our member teachers are directly authorized teachers, representatives, and traditional lineage holders, such as I'm an Ajahn, in several different traditional secular and Buddhist schools. Uh, first would be Putai Sawan Institute of Ayutthaya and Nongkam, uh, famous for martial arts and healing arts for 900 years. Actually, it's more than that now. Under Pak Kru Samai Mesamon, Grandmaster Pak Kru Samai Mesamon who was my personal teacher, who I lived with. Uh, Prawat Chetupan, the Buddhist temple, the famous Buddhist temple, the most famous Buddhist temple in Thailand, and the Wat Po Traditional Thai Medical School, which is one of the oldest schools of traditional arts anywhere, much less in Thailand, under Pakru Mo Bunsorn, Mo Kitniam, and Mo Siti Sopan, uh, Pakru Upakart and Pakru Men. I always like to give credit where credit is due. I mentioned Danny and Osanto for the Four Principles of Mastery, and I mentioned my teachers at Wat Po, and also uh, the Anantasuk Traditional Thai Medical School under Pakru Mo Anantasuk and Achan Mo Nantipa Anantasuk. The Buntal Tuk Hill Tribes Northern Provincial Hospital and Training Institute, also known as the Old Medicine Hospital of Shivago Komarpai under Achan Sentorn Chaichagun. Hill Tribe People, Groups of the North, Karen, Lisu, Humang, Lahu, and Mian that I traveled to many times over 40 years to be able to work with their elders and medicine people in person and bring that indigenous traditional tribal medicine back to the United States, back to our school here at the Soma Veda College of Thai of Natural Medicine and the Thai Yoga Center. ITM International Thai Massage at Chiang Mai under uh, Ajahn Grandmaster, John Chankal, uh, Mama Like Chaya, Nerve Touch Massage, she's passed away, but that's the Wat Suandak style. Buddhist Temple Wat Soan Kolok, School for the Blind, Foundation for the Blind under Ajahn Motawi, Wien Klai Kangwan Industrial Community College, sponsored by King Bumibon, the former king of Thailand, uh, working with Ananta Suk Thai Massage. The Lana School of Thai Traditional Medicine in Chiang Mai, wonderful people, wonderful, so focused on the Tok Sen and Ditta, uh, very traditional tool assisted energy line uh, applications for Thai traditional medicine and the Sri Thai Buddhist Foundation of Sukhothai and of um, uh, Southern Thailand as well at the Thai Medical Development Center under Pra Maha Sri Pai Apataro uh, Bangwa, who is just an amazing teacher and who also like the Lana School, uh, focuses on serious practice of medicine using traditional tools like Toksen, Ditda, Nuwat, um, uh, Prakop Samun Prai, and many, many other types of traditional Ayurvedic medicine Thai style. Soma Veda Ayurveda theory, the science, evidence, and traditional basis. It's an adaptation and reformulation of classical Ayurveda. So there are many kinds of classical Ayurveda. There is classical Indian Ayurveda. There's classical Tibetan Ayurveda. There's classical Nepalese Ayurveda, Bhutanese Ayurveda, uh, Burmese or Myanmar Ayurveda, Thai Ayurveda, Sri Lankan Ayurveda, even Filipino Ayurveda called Hilat and Ablan. And now we have Ayurveda as it's practiced in the West and America, for example, and in particular right here in Central Florida. So what we're doing is an adaptation and a reformulation. The reformulation comes from, again, research your own experience. As a Native American elder, I do incorporate Native American concepts into my practice of Ayurveda, and I try to pass that on to you as a functional variant that is very uh, helpful and works in our current world. 
We include major branches of classical and modern practice, just like I said, Thai, Indian, Tibetan, Sri Lankan, and Burmese. Under my direction, Dr. Anthony B. James, I have six doctorates plus a master's degree in clinical herbology. Most of my, five of my doctorates are in some form of natural medicine, naturopathy, acupuncture, oriental medicine, um, and then I have a doctorate in uh, pastoral humanities uh, from Pontificate uh, University. Okay, we are so I know a little bit about it. Uh, we are a multimodality and a holistic system in every sense of the word. Now, what is Ayurveda? The word is composed of, of two Sanskrit terms, Ayur plus Veda, and they that's how we get to Ayurveda. Most most traditionally, most modernly translated literally to mean life plus knowledge, and then that meaning or equaling the science of life. However, I want to say Ayurveda is literally means the art of how to be alive and not to die prematurely. In the Charaka Samhita, it states over and over and over and over again that if you follow these principles of Ayurveda, that you shall live the full term of your natural life with vigor and with luster and with brightness of mind and clarity of emotion and strength of spirit and that you will not die prematurely from the things that cause people to die prematurely. So this is functional. This is not just about fixing uh, a flat, uh, about uh, fixing something that's broken, about Band-Aids. It's not Band-Aid. This is not a symptom-derived, symptom-focused, or symptom-fetishized practice of uh, medicine. It's truly holistic. Significant attributes are, one, it's spiritual. It's not religion-based. You can be any religion and practice Ayurveda. You, any religion can practice Promiwihan C. Any religion. I'm a Christian. I practice Promiwihan C. I don't have a problem with that. Prevention and maintenance-oriented addresses causal factors in chronic disease. It's a multimodality approach with little or no side effects and thousands of published peer-reviewed studies on Ayurveda and its derivative systems of Ayush and traditional Thai medicine, for example. Ayurveda is an ancient primary medicine which is still practiced today. It's the oldest documented traditional indigenous medicine still in use today primary medicine for hundreds of millions of people for thousands of years. All right, let me really be clear about that. That's an understatement, okay? Since it's been primary medicine for the continent of Asia and the country of India all on its own, not including all those satellite countries, including Thailand, that's over a billion people. So it's primary medicine for a billion people for thousands of years. So we don't worry about a history of proof or validity and use like some might. It's not an experimental procedure. So much of what you hear about modern medicine and the cures that are purported and, and the things that you are supposed to bet your life on are experimental and unproven. Well, Ayurveda is not experimental and unproven. So we have this, India, Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Philippines until the colonial period. And of course, Thailand is the only country on the list that wasn't successfully colonized or formally colonized by military force, other than during the Japanese occupation of the Second World War, which was substantial and had an effect, but it was only for a year or two, four years maybe, tops. Thai Ayurveda is authentic and unique because it's intact. Okay, there weren't mass book burnings and censorship. Preserved over centuries in various religious uh, monastic orders as sacred practice of hands-on healing and medicine, and specifically those religious orders are the sannyasa of the Hindu religion and the Buddhist uh, religion, starting literally directly from the life of the Buddha. That's 2,500 years ago. The history of Ayurveda as well, it's, it's as long as there's such a thing as history. 
because of course, even though Ayurveda is primarily uh, identified with Indian culture, Indian history, Indian anthropology, and so on and so forth, its history of, of what is included under the Ayur, the umbrella of Ayurveda is actually much older. Even the, the author of the Charaka Samhita, Atria, the oldest book that we know of in Ayurveda, referred to himself as the last in an ancient tradition and that he was writing this material, that he was documenting this practice of Ayurveda so it wouldn't be lost for posterity and could be passed on to future generations. And of course, we now know that even the people, the indigenous and traditional people of India and in the continent of India didn't originate in India. And so you have the Scythian Aryans who literally originally come from Europe. Um, who had medicine well developed long before they ever landed uh, across the Himalayas and landed in India. India is considered the mother of all organized practice of medicine. Textbooks like the Sashruta Samhita and Charaka Samhita have an ancient history. As a result, Ayurveda grew into a respected and widely used system of healing in India, Asia, and Southeast Asia. And I want to say little sidebar here. We know now that there was communication. There was actual seaborne transport, trade, and exploration between Asia and South America and possibly even North America thousands and thousands of years ago. And so, for example, it's now been documented that there are Asian influences in South American medicine of the Olmecs, Toltecs, Aztecs, and possibly Incas too. Um, so there is actually an Asian Native American connection. And that's from the south up. And from the north down, we have the Asians who traveled, quote unquote, against the proverbial land bridge to populate uh, uh, portions of North America, who then also went all the way to South America. So there's a connection there. And um, we are exploring that as new information is available. I will try to pass it on to you. So around 1500 BCE, Ayurveda was delineated into eight specific branches of medicine, and there were two main schools. Atria, the school of physicians, and Davantari, the school of surgeons. And so we have these two primary texts. We have the Charaka Samhita and we have the Sashruta Samhita, um, which delineate those different eight uh, disciplines into their specific practices. These two schools made Ayurveda a more scientifically verifiable and classifiable medical system because they instituted they really institutionalize uh, systems and protocols that were uh, practiced by uh, practitioners wherever they were found. As early as the Mahabharata period, the Majapahit Mahalikan Empire of 1500 BCE, which of course Thailand was part of that empire, extended in part, as was the Philippines, Ayurveda was called the science of the eight components or the eight schools of medicine. And these are still today our eight focuses of the practice of traditional medicine. Internal medicine, pediatric surgery, eye and ENT, psychiatry, toxicology, prevention of disease, improving immunity and rejuvenation, aphrodisiacs and promoting health of progeny. And under aphrodisiacs, you could also say vitality enhancement. Okay, now, of course, in our modern time, we do not specialize in surgery because we have in the modern Western allopathic medical tradition, that's probably where it is most um, highly sophisticated and is uh, really effective, especially in surgery relating to trauma care and that kind of thing. So of course, there's, and there's many, many physicians who are good surgeons, and we, we kowtow to them and, and we let them be the good surgeons that they are, but we can handle most everything else uh, that's outside of the surgical purview. There was a time period of decline of Ayurveda, and we say that took place beginning with 
primarily the British and other Western powers' colonial rule. That's 18th to mid-20th century. This period is known as the Raj period of Indian history, also known as the Victorian Age, also known as the Industrial Age, also known as the Steampunk Age, um, and the, the Age of the Rail, uh, Iron Age, the modern Iron Age of railroads and Industrial Revolution and so on, which was literally on the backs of the conquered continent of India, which was thoroughly raped and, uh, raped and pillaged of its of its industry, of its uh, minerals, of its natural resources, uh, coal and iron and ore. And this is pretty much it's the backbone of the modern world that started with this conquering of India and the removal of its resources without consent of the Indian people, which continued right up until Indian independence. So it was also a period of massive censorship, book burnings, and restrictions of practice. Many, most schools of Ayurveda quit and had to go underground if they survived at all. Uh, there were huge, incredible uh, trends in book burnings and censorship. The British Raj period actually paid bounties on um, the acquisition of traditional scriptural, spiritual, and or medical books where they were collected and then they were burned. Uh, a few were sent to the British Library in uh, Great Britain. A few ended up in America, uh, but by and large, most of them were destroyed. Uh, they were considered non-essential since uh, Indians were no longer Indians. They were now part of the British Empire. They were now English. However, in spite of that, the medicine uh, survived. People were dedicated to have it survive, no matter what happened. All Ayurvedic texts and practices were outlawed by penalty of death, and people were put to death for this. Indigenous traditional Ayurvedic physicians and their practices were discredited by British and Western culture, and like I said before, many were forced to go underground. However, 1947, resurgence of Ayurveda with Indian independence. Official government support is able to happen now. The establishment of 100 plus Ayurvedic medical colleges, a standardized curriculum developed by Ayush for both classical indigenous Ayurveda, Unani, and Indian naturopathy. The WHO recognizes this over time and now formally registered as a national cultural heritage of India with further formal recognitions worldwide. There's a resurgence of Thai yoga in Thailand. Thai medicine also went under the radar for a few decades when the West gave scholarships in the 1950s for Thai doctors to study overseas here in America, Great Britain, Switzerland, etc. But in 1984, I authored a book in English called Traditional Thai Medical Massage, Nua Thai, Traditional Thai Medical Massage. And that was the first a book in English published in the United States on Thai traditional medicine. Popularity of Thai beauty and spa treatments with tourists worldwide. Oh, in reference to the book, of course there were other authors who were uh, publishing bits and pieces of their interpretation of Thai traditional medicine. But I was also probably one of the first to actually live in a Thai traditional medical school and to have formal recognition, not only from that school, but eventually from the Thai government itself uh, through the UTTS. Popularity of Thai beauty and spa treatments with tourists worldwide. Number one, service for diplomats and CEOs, even with COVID. Association of Thai Traditional Medical Doctors, an association in the early 90s. I was part of that, I'm privileged. Many of those meetings, I was the only foreigner in the meeting, the only Falang in the meeting. You can see photos from some of those meetings with the Department of Commerce and Traditional Medicine, et cetera, et cetera, on uh, my bio at thaiyogacenter.com. Associations, right? Royal Thai Ministry of Health Recognition in 1995. Formalization of standardized curriculum, federal licensing under Union of Thai Traditional Medicine Society, or uh, UTTS, of course, which I am uh, I've been granted a 
a lifetime, a, a lifetime uh, privilege or recognition in the UTTS. All right, I'm gonna move along here a little bit. So let's see, we're here. Uh, dump, 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 dump. We have two main concepts of health today that are wrestling with each other. The Western allopathic or absence of disease model, okay, and our Soma Veda and natural medicine model, which is all systems function optimally, energy is good, and mental state of happiness and contentment is actually a primary indicator of health or wellness or disease or not disease. Ayurveda defines health from the Sushruta Samhita. So we refer back to our elders and back to the traditional medical literature for the definitions that we're still using today. So it considers that there's a continuum of mind, spirit, and body. And such a one is called a healthy person whose doshas are balanced, whose digestion or agni is balanced, whose bodily tissues, datus and eliminations or malas are normal, whose sense, mind, and self are filled with bliss. That's a definition of health. So in our primary outcomes, uh, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, this is what we are hoping by emphasizing those things in a practical, functional way, spirit, mind, and body, these are the, the further outcomes that we would like to see. Notice again, there's nothing here that would be on a list of, of approved or medical outcomes of any Western medical practice. Some of it a perspective on the human species. So we're treating human beings, right? Although I use Ayurveda on my um, dog, <laughs> my cat, and my animals, and I always have. Uh, but we primarily work on human species. And by the way, the Ayurveda works on dogs and dogs don't know they're supposed to get well because they're being given Ayurveda. We have an inner intelligence, Atma it's called, or innate, underlying all mental, emotional, physiological structure and functions. We are human biological, multidimensional, electromagnetic, stress adaptive, transform transformational machines. We have and are made up of consciousness, vital, energetic, and physical constituents, Shen, the matrix, and matrix body, and the physical body. And we exist synergistically in relation to each other. Gaia and the greater universal web of life and creation, synergistically, sympathetically, okay, symbiotically, and if those relationships of sympathy and symbiosis are deficient, are damaged, are broken, are absent, we become sick and die. Elements of Soma Veda, Thai Yoga, Ayurveda, not in conventional Western medicine. By and large, rare exception, every once in a while you run into uh, a medical, uh, institutional medical doctor or institution that will give some credence to these principles um, and kudos to them. When you find them, support them. All right, so we'll start over here. Sophisticated systematic approach to the prevention of disease. Our emphasis is on prevention of de disease, not addressing symptoms. Extensive systematic approach to maintenance of health. Individualized and personalized. Every treatment is meant to be unique to the person and to the person's life and community and family and life circumstances, situation and history that they bring with them to the table. Those are all considered. So we have to take time to consider those. Both traditional and non-invasive modern assessments. We use pulse diagnosis, postural analysis to EKGs. We will use uh, modern Western uh, biologic testing and assessive criteria that's non-invasive and which is legal for us to do. Assess and addresses the origin of the disease or condition. Origins, causes are considered fundamentally important. Assess and addresses role of toxicity and deficiency procedures. We have traditional methodologies for reducing deficiencies and toxicities. Considers, assesses, 
and addresses body type and doshic influences, while Western systems, other than maybe uh, a lip service to metabolic type, anabolic, catabolic, etc., uh, don't really care or consider about body types. For us, body types are actually quite important. We emphasize spiritual, energetic, consciousness, and mind-body balance as vital elements. We consider happiness and satisfaction with life and vital as vital elements. We have sophisticated approaches to optimizing diet, digestion, and nutrition as spiritual duty. As a spiritual duty, we believe it's important, sacred nutrition and the role of, of interacting with life as a consumer of energy, of food, as a spiritual process, as a sacred process. Extensive sacramental herbal and natural supplemental pharmacopoeia, every natural thing is medicine. An indigenous and traditional medicine belief system, which, which we represent, we believe that there is nothing in nature that is not innately therapeutic or healing according to its nature. And we study that, and we wish to learn more about that. And that's an, a tradition and an emphasis, if you want to say, that we've been given by our elders. We emphasize behavior and lifestyle prevention or change in prevention and treatment of chronic disease. We think it's as important who you are in your life um, as why you are not well in your life. Ayurveda's three primordial functions of life are sattvic principle, tamasic, and rajasic. And so this is a, a, a triad principle. This is an iteration of yin and yang and reconciling between yin and yang. And these three primordial functions, sattvic, tamasic, and rajasic, in turn manifest as our three primary operating systems. Now, they're not mutually exclusive. All of them are present and functioning all of the time. The only thing that changes is the percentage of emphasis. They're expressed as three primary doshas, which literally dosha means defilements. In classical literature, dosha is a manifestation of the ego, which it manifests the moment that you're born. So, you know, don't feel bad. Uh, in some Christian tradition, we'd say this is a, a, a original sin. Okay, three elemental energies or humans, humors, defilements, or doshas. They govern factors of the physiology. They're mind body operators that all together determine our ability to live and function at any given time. We call them vata, pitta, and kapha. And like I said, even though you might have heard that you may have a body type with one of these vata, pitta, or kapha, please understand all of them are functioning all of the time and they're always all dependent on each other. The only thing that changes is the percentages and emphasis of them according to various factors. The significance of the doshas is that when balanced, the three doshas promote the proper functioning of the body's innate intelligence, the Atman, to support all homeostatic self-repair mechanisms. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? When the three doshas are balanced, when they're in balance, the three doshas obstruct the proper functioning of the body's innate intelligence, thereby debilitating homeostatic self-repair mechanisms. Either way, we're talking about the body's innate intelligence, the atma, the shen, the internal consciousness, quan or spiritual consciousness that exists within us, that within us is that is here solely to support our function of life in this life. Vata, Pitta, and Kapha have some fairly dramatic qualities that help us identify them. Vata is associated with air or loam, Pitta with fire or phi, water with, uh, Kapha with water or nam, and they have these different characteristics. They also basic uh, govern bodily functions conform with uh, movement. So vata emphasizes that. Blood circulation, respiration, elimination, and heartbeat. So of course, vata is uh, a strong emphasis and any emphasis of a respiratory or cardiopulmonary issue. Because we've got heart and we have lungs. 
PETA has to do with digestion, absorption, assimilation, temperature, control, hunger, or thirst. Cough has to do with muscle fat, bone, fluid balance, and mucus. So basically our structure and function. And the basic principles So how do we determine which of these doshas that need balancing is through primarily two elements. One is to identify the patient's constitutional type, their body-mind type, which is called prakruti, diagnose underlying patterns of imbalance at the root or of current or future disease, and this is called vikruti. What's the difference? Prakruti is your nature, your basic trait, your constitutional type, body-mind type. It determines your personality. It changes little over your lifetime. It's a normal state of your body. And I will say over and over again, it's sort of the nature's equivalent of your make and model, of your make and model. You know, your Ford 150 truck. And then what? which Ford 150 truck? Super cab, short bed, extended bed. That's Prakruti. Vikruti is abnormal disease state, underlying conditions of imbalance at the root of current or future disease. Current changes and current and changes throughout your life and changes from internal and external circumstances. So now think of Vikruti with that Ford 150 truck, uh, which had a collision and the back bumper is now deformed, or it has a flat tire, or it's got 200,000 miles and needs a tune-up or the seats uh, have some rips and tears and the body needs some body work. That's a V-Cruti. Recruti determines our make and model, just like I said, seated dosha or body type and changes little over time. Our pro or constitution gives us certain predictable attitudes, inclinations, appearances, strengths, and weaknesses. See, here's something really, really key to understand about Ayurveda and traditional Native American medicine. Once you know the type, the animal type, the body type, the elemental type, the blood type of the person, you already know that there are certain things that you can predict about that person, no matter who they are, no matter what age they are, no matter where they come from, no matter their genetic heritage. There are certain things that will be predictable. And the vikruti is when imbalances between the doshas arise. And what can disturb this balance of vata, pitta, and kapha? Mental, emotional, spiritual factors causing stress, unhealthy diet, GMOs, pesticides, artificial sweeteners, and the like, unhealthy behaviors, lifestyle or disturbing routines, excessive mask wearing, and prolonged isolation can definitely disturb the doshas. We are now seeing an epidemic of dosha imbalance for obvious reasons. Environmental disturbances, radiation, EMF, ELF, microwave, cell phone, 5G, pollution, weather. Anything that comes from outside. In Oriental medicine, we refer to these things as external pernicious influence. Bad medicine, chemical pharmaceuticals, dangerous, i.e. experimental and or contaminated vaccines, because that's a big concern in the world today. And yes, you're going to see people who will have variations of uh, illnesses from sudden death to disabilities to long-term chronic immune system related types of problems directly attributable to the vaccines. We're going to have to become experts in using Ayurveda and natural medicine, Native American medicine, homeopathy, naturopathy, and all of the tools that are in our bag to treat people with these issues because it's now the most prevalent health crisis in the world today. Dosha imbalance, because T looks like dis-ease. Constitutional types in the population. It's not even. The doshas all work together, but they don't all work together in the same proportion and symmetry, nor are they distributed in the population in the same proportion and symmetry. Approximately 80% of the population are bidoshic. Individuals have all three operators, vata, pitta, and kapha, in their constitution or body type to some degree or another. One or two of these doshas are more dominant at any given time in a particular person. The three monodoshic types. 
approximately 10% of the population are considered monodoshic types. Vata, Pitta, or Kapha. And as a practitioner, that's really the first thing that you're, you're trying to determine. That's your measuring stick, if you will. Our approach to prevention and disease and treatment addresses the person. Person is a spirit, is a mind, is a body, is a behavior, is how they respond to the environment that you find them in. We have a mind-body approach, approach. Nuat Thai, Thai Nuat, as a dancing meditation, as good for the giver as for the receiver. You know, it's really interesting. We're the only form of medicine that actually improves the health of the practitioner equal to or greater than that of the clients. And that, that is a traditional way of describing what we do, that it's as good for the giver as for the receiver. We use uh, BET, tapping, EFT, energy psychology to rectify unresolved negative emotions and distortions of the body's energy, otherwise referred to me usually as NEMOs, old, unresponsive, negative, emotional fears and phobias, negative emotional constructs. And we have uh, technology based on uh, traditional medicine in Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine especially that we use, which are very, very effective. In fact, the EFT tapping energy psychology as recently as the last year or two has been, uh, has been adopted and has been approved as a primary therapy for psychiatric and psychological mental disorders, non-drug based where the practical expression of loving kindness is a sacramental and as a religious therapy, I wanna say more than that, as a sacerdotal duty of ministry. I'm a minister and it is my duty to practice love practically, to express love practically. We use a mind-body approach. We have a physical approach, which is laying on of hands or chirothesia, Ancient tradition practiced by spiritual healers for millennium. Panchakarma detox regimen, Nuat Prakop herbs, and also martial arts. And I'm an Achan in Thai martial arts, Krabi, Krabong, Moi Buran, and Moi Thai, uh, among other things. I mentioned my, JD, my uh, JKD training with uh, Grandmaster Eno Santo previously. I'm also a black belt and jiu-jitsu among other things. And yes, we have, we acknowledge the healing powers of martial arts and we train in martial arts and we recommend martial arts and yogic arts like uh, Kalari Payat and Hatha Yoga and so on and so forth as part of our physical approach toward healing. But they also have a mental aspect, meditation, Jitana Mai, again, there's martial arts, Reiki in psychology, that's Wilhelm Reich, Native American Medicine and Ceremony, and also documented in my book, Angels Speak, which is a manual for psychological um, healing and maintaining yourself. Emotional, biotapping, nutrition approach, fourth-way psychology, ministerial counseling. Read The Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution by P.D. Spensky. It's one of our primers. Spiritual practice of the Native American Indigenous Church, Puja Prayer Sacrament, Ceremony, Death, and Facilitation Transition Therapies, Vitalism, and Sacred Food. We have a three-tiered approach to healing. The practitioner discovers the underlying patterns of dosha imbalance along with, we use intake forms and case histories, Ayurvedic questionnaires, we use clinical and Ayurvedic assessments, pulse diagnosis, Nadi Vigyan, dosha triangle assessment, and astrology. We use direct observation, communication, intuition, and medical dowsing, both with pendulums and with radionic appliances. And we do sophisticated biometric analysis using our advanced St. John POC wellness screening or rapid checkups. That's for advanced practitioners only, but it is something that I and we do. Some of Ada traditional assessments. How do we determine Vikruti? We use pulse diagnosis. We look at the kosha or body type. We look at the element or datu. We do a prakruti chart or questionnaire. 
We do direct observation of signs and symptoms, dosha by function, dosha by attribute, tongue assessment, skin assessment, orifice, what goes in, you know, um, Thai sin lines, prana nadi, TCM meridians, Hawaiian hunas cords, Hawaiian huna cords, chakras, Thai loam, Ayurveda, Marma, Bindu, traditional Chinese medicine, acupoints, and Ashi points, Coruscant astrology, or Thai-based medical astrology. We teach and use all of these. That gives us our triangle of determining Vikruti, which then gives us direct inclination toward therapeutic process. Our primary therapeutic tool in Soma Veda is the therapeutic day. What is the therapeutic day? The Soma Veda therapeutic day. It's nine to 12 hours of treatment divided into seven different sessions. Now, sidebar, minimum. Soma Veda therapeutic day protocols, minimum nine to 12 hours of treatment divided into seven sessions. It could be 27 sessions, depending on the client. However, this is our entry level therapeutic protocol we teach in every program, every practitioner program, we teach this, we emphasize this, why? Because it's a traditional model and it works. Day one is assessment and a short general session. Day two is a supine position intensive. Day three is sideline position intensive. Day four is a prone position intensive. Day five is the second supine abdominal and leg stretching intensive. Day six is a seated position intensive. And day seven is a long general plus a reassessment. Where do we go from here? That gives us enough time, nine to 12 hours, to get into nutrition, to get into emotion, to get into psychology, to get into lifestyle, to get into recommendations for health, health coaching, to get into lifestyle counseling, to get into the actual applications of therapy and pranayama and coaching and teaching yoga postures as necessary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and only Protocols can do this. Knock off repetitive sessions can't do any of that. And so therefore they are repetitive, stressful, and limited in their possibilities for outcomes based on the traditional model. Our therapeutic guiding principles are like increases like and opposites are used as medicine. Some of Veda is a multimodality approach. So we have Ayurveda, spiritual medicine, vitalism, ritual, devotion, surrender, mantra, bhakti, meditation, tantra, puja, prayers, and affirmations. We have laying on of hands, carathesia, abhyanga, oleation, massotherapy, manipulation, ditta and tai, manual therapy, yoga. All eight limbs or branches we practice with earthing and grounding. Whole nother conversation there. Acupuncture, acupressure, manual, and electrovibrational. Photobiomodulation or light based therapies, sacred homeopuncture using homeopathics and acupressure, uh, either manually or with magnets, classical sacred herbal pharmacology and aromatherapy, Nuat Prakop Samun Pry, detoxification regimens of Panchakarma, colon hydrotherapy, infrared magnets, and pulse magnetic therapy or PEMF, and vibration therapies. Still more, spiritual medicine using ritual, ceremony, and sacrament. We do puja with every client. We, we pray for them and we teach them how to pray. But as Native Americans, we practice at least 11 major different variations of traditional ceremony for medicine and for healing. Sacred and traditional, such as birth ceremony, breath ceremony, the holy, the holy anointing ceremony of Carthesia, marriage blanket, passing on or spirit ceremony, potlet ceremony or sacred food and eating of natural unadulterated food and supplements to create union with spirit, union with God, sacred pipe and tobacco ceremony, herbs and plant sacrament, all plants are sacred. Any and all plants or minerals may be used for healing, for the healing ceremony. Spirit dance, purification, sweat or purification lodge ceremony, 
Sundance ceremony, vision quest, and making of relatives, hunka, or adoption ceremony. And I see a typo here. I'm going to fix right this second. So these are all traditional Native American ceremonies, which are part of the Soma Veda system. Again, multi-modality, therapeutic, protocol-based approach. We stress customized individual programs, diet and nutrition, sacred nutrition, herbal and natural supplement preparations, sacred waters, mental emotional balance and stress reduction, stress management through biotapping, EFT, energy psychology, meditation, Vedic exercise of yoga, pranayama, and martial arts, lifestyle behavioral modification, daily and seasonal health routine, self-treatment and hygiene, Vedic vibration therapy, light sound energy, magnetism, environmental health strategies, and no dangerous drugs, radiation, chemical surgery, or toxic substances. Nobody ever dies from being treated with Native American medicine or Ayurvedic medicine. We use elemental therapies, sacred nutrition therapies, purging, cleansing, mental health therapies, that's traditional for us, midwifery, life balancing, death facilitation and transition therapy, martial arts and exercise. I'm gonna do a video just on our, our uh, some of our death uh, practices in the near future. Back to nature approach, earthing, grounding technique and technology. It's the simplest and cheapest thing you can do to support your immune system. We teach that. Pranayama, Janayanga, Vishnanamaya, Yoga, safe and non-invasive adjunct Western medical clinical assessments such as blood pressure, temperature, urinalysis, BIA, EKG, ECG, capillary scopy, digital thermography, metabolic X syndrome screening, CLIA wave testing, etc. And we teach these in our program, more so in the advanced programs, maybe even in our doctoral programs at the Soma Veda College of Natural Medicine, which I recommend that you look at at somaveda.org. Traditional Indian sacred health care educational program, emphasizing native diabetes care counselor and provider certification. That's an add-on. You have to complete at least one of the other programs to uh, do the coursework on the Native Diabetes Care Counselor Certification Program. Okay, we do grounding. We practice panchakarma, purification, rejuvenation, treatment. We use natural herbal therapeutics, compounding of individual herbal ingredients, uh, learning about herbs and learning about herbal medicines, low to, which have low to no harmful secondary effects when used appropriately. We practice Nuat Prakop Samun Pry, and we teach this in our advanced classes using herbs and aromatic preparations for internal and external use, one of the more popular traditional therapeutic protocols. Soma Veda, Thai Yoga, Ayurveda. Swastaya, Swastaya. Raksha Matarosaya, Roga Navaranam, to rejuvenate and preserve the health of the healthy and alleviate the disease of the sick. This is, this is the core of our practice. And I invite you to join with us to transition from whatever you've been doing that maybe is not so holistic and not so spiritual and not so practical, especially uh, considering the current uh, health climate and circumstances. And I also invite you to join us if you're looking for a career that's ethical, moral, and which is about causing no harm and causing an tremendous healing and improving the welfare of yourself and everyone that you know, your friends, family, and community. We can help you with that. But we can't help you if we don't hear from you. So if you're already in one of our programs, I hope you got some indications here that there's still more to learn and you need to consider the more advanced programs of the ALC, AHC, AYT, Thai Yoga Teacher Program, or join our college, especially consider at the Soma Veda College of Natural Medicine, the Barefoot Doctors Program in Indigenous or Traditional and Indigenous Medicine, which can lead you to a doctorate in Traditional and Indigenous Medicine in 8 to 12 months. And you can do the whole thing online. 
If you are confused or you need help or you need a personal consultation, then call me or email me anytime and let's set up a time to do that and help sort out if and whether and how the Thai Yoga Center, the Soma Veda College of Natural Medicine, Learn Thai Yoga, any of our entities can actually help you. And of course, if you're looking for a practitioner, there's a practitioner directory of graduates at the ThaiYogaCenter.com website, ThaiYogaCenter.com. Again, I'm Dr. Anthony B. James, Dean and Director of the Thai Yoga Center of the Soma Veda College of Natural Medicine, and Achan, and Vidya, and Ayurveda, and Natural Medicine, and I'm wishing you well and look forward to seeing you in class. God bless and have a terrific day.